welcome everybody. Uh, one of the things that we, we have at Petra Coach is we have, a, we have a core value set, like all the companies that we work with. And one of our core values is we have your back or I have your back no matter what. And probably this last week more than ever, we've practiced that uh, internally and externally and retooled the way we offer our services to the community and are looking to bring in um, experts like uh, John Spence to deliver messages to the people that we work with. So today is uh, John Spence's day. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about John. I've got a copy of your book here. Thank you. Uh, this is an incredible- I've got a copy of yours. So we, now we've sucked up to each other appropriately. Very good. So um, John did write the foreword to Vitamin B. And uh, this is one of the very first books I read when I got into the coaching business. And it aligns so well with our principles and the way that we think here at Petra uh, that John and I have been friends uh, for a very long time and help each other. Um, John is recognized as one of the, the very top business thought leaders and leadership development experts in the entire world. He gets recognized all over the place. For more than 30 years, John has traveled worldwide helping people and businesses be more successful. Uh, he's going to share some of that knowledge with us today. He's the author of five books. I only showed you one of them. He's a business consultant, workshop facilitator, keynote speaker, and executive coach with clients ranging from Fortune 500 firms to small businesses and other organizations in between, which gives him um, experiences he can now share with us. Um, he revolves his career around making the very complex, as I said earlier, awesomely simple. Uh, today, he's going to cover several topics that will help your business survive this challenging time and set you up to thrive once it's passed. Uh, John, when I opened our, our huddle this morning with our team, um, you know, I said defense to offense. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been playing, uh, you know, a hell of a lot of defense in the last week, right? Yeah. And, you know, we still have more de defense to play, obviously. And we got to get people thinking in an offensive mindset. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. You've got your slides ready to go. Uh, I'm sure we're going to do Q&A. There is a Q&A box inside of the webinar link. So anybody that wants to ask a question, I'll receive those and deliver those to John so he can get them answered. And then um, you also have the chat if you want to chat and I'll monitor that. So John, I'm going to step back and give you the floor. Thanks, Andy. Hey, everybody. Thank you very, very much for taking some time out of your day. And I'm going to not waste a minute of it before I go. I just want to say, Andy, Leah, Danielle, your whole team, thank you. It's an honor to be here and to help you have your folks back. So with that said, I'm going to go through a couple. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And there we go. Oh, there's that. Have you got that, team? Andy, have you got that as your screen? I got it. Okay. So let me go from the beginning here. All right, so we have slides up. Uh, it's great to be with everybody, Petra Coach, and let's get rolling now. As Andy mentioned, I've been studying leadership for about, well, I've led several companies. I've been the owner and CEO of five companies, two of them multinational. Uh, read a lot. Uh, Andy and I were arm wrestling over this before we got started. I do about 100 to 120 business books a year, and I have every year since 1989. So I've led companies. I've studied it. I've had the great pleasure of working with some of the top leaders and some of the worst leaders <laughs> in the world. And during that entire time, I've looked for the pattern of things that work well. And during that entire time, leadership has changed actually pretty dramatically. When I first got into business, which would have been 1987 or 88, uh, it was all command and control. When my boss said jump, it was how high, sir, uh, and how many times. It was all white males and it was all directive. Uh, then, several years later, it sort of shifted over to what I call leadership by spreadsheet. Everything was numbers, numbers, numbers. If you needed to make your numbers, you just reduced headcount. Uh, now, the pendulum has swung to an area that both Andy and I strongly, strongly support, which is servant leadership, where you flip the normal leadership model on its head from uh, the leader at the top to directing and telling everyone else what to do to the leader at the bottom supporting, helping, uh, in empowering everyone else in the organization. And I think that this, especially in these times, and the things I'm going to share with you are, are, are things that I've talked about for a while, but they've just been magnified dramatically in the last couple of weeks. So this idea of serving your, your followers, empowering them, supporting them, helping them be successful, absolutely critical right now, and it's going to stay critical. Sorry about that. There we go there, and there we go. So 
as I look at leadership going forward into the future, there's three quotients, if you will, that I believe are going to be fundamental to being a successful leader. The first one is your IQ, uh, your intelligence quotient, which many people will tell you can't go up. That's not true. Uh, with brain plas plasticity and other things we're studying right now, you can increase your IQ. You can also decrease it if you're sitting home watching too much Netflix or enjoying too many cocktails in the evening right now. Uh, so it, it's an area you can, and the word I really use here is not IQ as much as competence. And this doesn't mean you have to have, you know, 15 advanced degrees from Ivy League schools and have been a former NASA astronaut. It just means that for the job you do, well, actually, there's two areas you have to be competent. You got to be competent in whatever your job is within the organization, and you have to be highly competent as a leader. So the first question is IQ or competence, will, which will continue and always will be important. So uh, as we were, Andy and I again, we're talking about reading, I'll throw a little statistic at you. The average college graduate, after they graduate from school, how many books do you think they read for self-improvement or business improvement? To get better at what I call skills-based reading, and it's not just books, it's YouTube and iTunes View and uh, let me see, podcasts, TED Talks, uh, audio books, reading books, your Kindle. If you add all that together, how many books, quote unquote, does the average college graduate read to be better at their life or their career? The answer is 0.5 per year, a half a book per year. If you were to read one book every other month, six books a year, you'd be in the top 1% in whatever country you live in, top 1% in the United States, America, Canada, whatever it might be. If you were to read one book a month, 12 books a year, you're in the top 1% on the face of the earth. Uh, if you're gonna lead a company, lead an organization, you need to be curious, constantly learning. And many of us now find a little bit of extra time on our hands when we would normally be chat with other folks in the office or you know, going out to lunch or whatever. I highly, highly recommend that you replace that time and maybe the Netflix time with reading, watching TED Talks, watching powerful YouTube videos, um, taking in as much information as you possibly can because the information you take in is going to allow you to find the answers to the problems you're facing right now. And the more information, the more opportunity there is to, to find better solutions. So I choose the first one. He choose the next one. And I think, yes. So I think that there's a really good point there to kind of expand on um, the level of information that's coming at us right now. And I know in our organization, you know, we've got about 25 people that, that, you know, half of their time right now is just looking at information. One of the examples is the bill that's in, um, being voted on today, it's supposed to be at noon, it's 247 pages of data, right? Um, and we pulled that apart and tore it down into you know, digestible chunks for everybody to, to read it and know what's going on. So I think, and I told my team this this morning, you know, we have this unique time right now to really amp up our education. So that IQ side, like never before, just simply with the data that's coming at us so we can make better decisions as business people. So I think right now is a perfect time to make this happen. Yeah, I'm talking to a bunch of my clients that are, I do a lot of CEO coaching, and I used to say, give me 20 minutes a day, dead minimum of studying. I've now upped that to 30 or 30 minutes or an hour. I you know, used to go to lunch with somebody, unless you're on the, you know, on Zoom talking to them, making that connection, take that time, set it aside for yourself to relax a little bit, to put all this stuff that's happening out of your mind, and read a couple of articles on leadership or teamwork or connection or communication that's gonna help you be a more effective leader as well as keeping up with all the stuff with coronavirus. So good point and please, Andy, keep adding in or asking questions. Awesome. So EQ, uh, the way I look at EQ, this is your emotional quotient, uh, which is basically self-awareness and empathy put together. Uh, and this is your ability to, to make connections with other people. And several years ago, I took two tests, uh, one on EQ and one on self-competitiveness. And when I got the results back, the, receipt, the researcher told me I had the highest score she had ever seen on self-competitiveness. And I'm like, yes, number one. <laughs> and she's like, this really isn't a test you want to be the best at. I'm like, no, no, I'm the best, right? I, I, I got the highest score ever. She's like, yeah, but you have one of the lowest scores we've ever seen in EQ. So this is an area that I struggle with a lot. I'm, I'm a very data-driven person, but I've realized and doing, doing workshops with my clients around the world, 
I will ask them to do the elements of the best leader you've ever seen and the elements of the worst leader you've ever seen. And when I balance out how many are IQ versus EQ issues, it's EQ about five to seven to one over IQ, both positive and negative. It was their inability to connect with people, being arrogant, condescending, whatever it might be. It was their ability to make genuine connections with people that made them such a great leader. Uh, so for people like us or me that are really not high on EQ, here's the idea. Just like IQ, you have to be curious. But instead of curious around information, you need to be curious around people, about their feelings, about their thoughts, their perspective. Um, one of the things I've learned now in almost 30 years doing this is I'm not right. I used to think I had the right answer, and I used to think that people paid me to give them the right answer. And now I realize there is no one right answer. There is no one way to look at things. So I've now tried to become extremely curious. So as a leader, curiosity and then the two things that go under that to me under communication are asking great questions and then being an intense listener, wanting to understand things and wanting to know how your people feel, what they're thinking, what their emotions are. And we're going to go into this in just a second and talk about the emotions. So EQ is actually, you still have to have good IQ. EQ is actually much more important than IQ or as important or more important than IQ right now. So and let's take a second and talk about emotions. Will you jump? Um, to, uh, yes, Andy. Will you t jump in, John, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, how somebody can be better at that? And because we don't have a lot of time for people to figure out how to be great at it, but people do need to get really good at it right now. So the, the whole thing is asking how people are doing. How are you feeling? And then the ability also to be reflective. So tell me how you're doing. And they'll get and say, I understand that you're, you're scared right now. Uh, yeah, and you have every right, right to be, and I can, I can see that you have a lot of anxiety. Um, what are some of the things I can do to help you? What can we do together? So recognizing those emotions, instead of just getting down to business and saying, what are we going to do? Stop and say, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? What's on your mind? And then carefully listening and watching. This is why this sort of stuff is so critical to see each other's faces. When someone answers a question, you can tell they're not fully telling you the truth to back up and say, I'm not sure, but I feel like that you, there might be something else going on here. Can we just stop for a minute and discuss your point of view, how you see things, what's going on in your mind, what your take is, questions like that. And then uh, critical again, validate those. Don't say you shouldn't feel that way. Don't be scared. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. Say, I can see that you're scared and I understand that. And, and you have every right to be. I can see that you're worried about your family. You've just told me that. Um, I'm proud of you for trying to take care of your family the best you possibly can. So it's watch, listen, validate, and support, not argue or tell people what to do. Let me stop for a minute, Andy. Did that sound like it was on target? Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, this is perfect. So watch, listen, validate, and support. And um, my, my daughter is in her senior year of college. She's supposed to graduate May the 2nd. Um, you know, none of that today is going to be able to happen. She's, you know, pretty torn up about it. So I spent a little bit of time with her in that same space, having that a conversation around, you know, validating her feelings, letting her, it's okay to feel this way because we all kind of feel this way. And uh, with my team this morning, I said, look, every, if you haven't fractured yet, you're going to fracture. Like there's going to oh, yeah. be a fracture point. And we all have to be ready for that and be okay and be able to just embrace it for a second, let it happen, be okay, and then and then begin to move on. So yeah, uh, let know. me recommend a great book here, very short book, but it's one that I give to all the people I coach. It's called I Hear You. I Hear You, and I don't know the author off the top of my hand. We can Google it later and put it in there, but uh, it's all about what I just said. Listen, validate, support, all those sort of things, and it gives you a, a framework, and it's very, very powerful. I, and, and for someone who's been doing this a long time, for me to get a simple book that gave me a step-by-step -step process that I could intellectually apply to be more emotionally connected was very, very helpful. So let's look at the chart that's on in front of you. And this is people's emotional response to perceived negative change. This is actually the cycle that people go through when someone close to them dies. Uh, and when people are faced with uh, negative change, which we are now faced with overwhelming negative change, to just put it bluntly, 
the people that you that you love, you work with, the people that you lead are are going to go through this emotional roller coaster. They're gonna fracture, Andy, just like you said. So let's step back and compare sort of where we are against this. And it, it, it's pretty straightforward. What was it, three weeks ago, we had stability? Three or four weeks ago, you know, we were hearing some things about China, but we weren't really worried about it that much. Everything was gonna be okay. And now a lot of us are in the next two phases, immobilization. We don't know what to do. We're like deer in the headlight. We're, we're stuck and we're stopped. Along this same line, some people have are, some people are in immobilization. A lot of people too are in denial. Um, I live in Florida. Up until today, we had spring breakers on the beach, people having barbecues, people doing stuff like that. Literally today, they shut down all the state parks in the entire state of Florida and said, don't go to the beach. So we've got a bunch of people that don't believe in social distancing. They're not doing it. They're having friends over. They're going to the beach. They're having barbecues. They're in denial. There's a lot of people like that, unfortunately. Once things start to get worse, and they're going to, uh, people are going to start to get angry. We see that already. They're angry at the government. They're angry that they can't get a test. They're angry there's not enough, you know, that. They're angry they lost their job. And again, they have every right to be. I would be angry or upset uh, and anxious. The next couple of stages we're going to move into, and we're starting to, um, you saw Governor Cuomo trying to bargain with the national government, federal government. So we're going to get people bargained. Do I really have to self-quarantine? Can't I go to my office? Do I really have to do that? Can't I just do this little bit of thing over here? It's not going to hurt anybody. Can't I just go visit my, my parents, my grandparents? Uh, no, you can't. And when they figure out, no, you can't, uh, we're going to see some massive, massive depression uh, and the isolation we're in right now is not going to help that. So as leaders, uh, and eventually we'll begin, and I don't know whether it's going to be weeks or months or multiple months, we're going to be able to test going back outside and test going back to work. And I think this is going to change a lot of the ways we work and work with other people. But eventually there'll be an acceptance of the, I hate the word, but new normal, the new way we work, the new way we interact. But right now and soon as a leader, you're going to realize that your people are going to go through this and they're pretty soon going to fracture. We could re replace depression with fracture and you got to be there to support them and help them and understand that everyone goes through this same cycle at some level, some a little flatter, some a little uh, more uh, severe. So understand the emotional part of this. It isn't just about facts and data and information and numbers. There, it's more, much more about EQ and emotion right now. Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. So, so when I look at this chart, which I think is genius in the way it's laid out, it makes it very clear with what's happening with people's, people in our organizations and around us. Um, and, I, and I can pinpoint and put different peoples in my own organization where they fall on this graph today, myself included. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the key things is to not run away from this. As a leader in a business, you know, myself included, I have a tendency when somebody's like, you know, I'll say it this way, whining about something. I'm like, oh, you know, come on, man. But, you know, at this time, and I've had to learn how to be much better at this over time, we have to run towards this because this is going to be a very big issue for us. And as leaders, we're going to have to go figure out how to be better at this. And we got like three days to go do it or less. Yeah. Uh, we did just get the link to the book I hear you posted um, in the chat. So, I like that that's tactical ways to address this. And if we take this chart and we can kind of think about our team members and where they're falling and be proactive with this instead of reactive, I think that's going to be key. Yeah, I, I, my favorite CEO in the world it runs a company that not many people would know. Um, it's called Philadelphia Gear. It's part of a larger thing. It's named Carl Rapp. And he had a phrase that I loved. And it was before this, it was with his, his customers, run to the problem. The minute there's a problem, just run and fix it. We'll worry about payment later. We'll worry about all that other stuff. The first thing we're going to do is go fix the problem. So I think, Andy, what you just said is right now we have to run at the problem and not jog, not skip, but sprint because we got to get on this stuff fast. And the emotional side of this is going to be a big part of our leadership journey of helping our people through this. Cool. So this is another area that we need to focus on as leaders. And this comes from some Harvard research, Google research, but there's three main things that people look for in every important relationship in their life, and their work relationship is a critical one. SBA, 
The first one is safety. And another word here I'll add here, which is, is even more important right now, is stability. People want to know that they're going to be safe, their job is safe, their life will be stable as much as humanly possible. And I would think this is the highest fear that most people have is, is am I physically safe? Am I, you know, healthy? Am I uh, emotionally safe? Am I not losing control of my emotions or people around me? Is my job safe? And can I have some modicum of stability in my life? And they're going to really, really look to their leaders and their organizations to help them feel more stable. And I think, Andy, you'll agree with me on this. That's, it's an important role. It's a role that we need to honor and really take seriously as leaders. I remember I, I used to lay awake at night when I ran a big company thinking about the, the 40 kids I had to put through college. I don't have any kids, but at that time, the people that worked for me had you know 40 kids that were going to have to go to school, and I felt like I had to send them there. Right now, we have, we have to have people's back and give them as much as we can some idea of safety and stability. The B, which is a major challenge right now, is belongingness. Before you move, can I, Go ahead. I, want, to, I want to get your insight on this because this is a place that I'm challenged a little bit, and I think most leaders will be challenged as well. So uh, the balance between tra complete transparency and, um, you know, a, a and providing a, a safety, right? So providing stability and transparency, right? So how do you, how do you, how do you blend those two together? Because there's a lot of craziness that's happening in the background that I'm not sure everybody needs to know. And what part of that do we need to expose to our team members? Okay, so this is a, this is a really, question. really important question. And the answer is going to be hard for some people. The way that you do that is you have made a ton of investment and trust with your people. You've empowered them. You've allowed them to make mistakes. You've, uh, you've always had their back. When things go bad, you've been there and you've done it enough times that when you say, um, hey, I can't, I can't tell you everything that's going on right now, but I promise you when I have information that's critical for you to know and you know that the minute I do, I will bring it to you. So let me handle this part of it for right now. I've trusted you for years. I've empowered you. I've given you, a, you know, I've really invested in this emotional trust bank account. Now is the time you're going to have to uh, take a little bit of it out and say, Focus on your work, focus on your health, focus on your family. I've had your back for 10 years. I've got your back now. Don't worry about uh, all the things that are happening in the background. Let me worry about that. Then when something is critical that you need to know, I will bring it to you immediately. If you've been a good leader, you've built up that account and you've built up enough trust that instead of calling each other and getting on Zoom or whatever and talking, you know, blah, 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 they'll be saying, okay, Andy's always had my back. I've got, uh, he's got it now. I'm going to do the best work I can possibly do and trust that he's going to take good care of me. Does that make sense, Andy? Totally does, man. And that's a good way of looking at it. And I just, you know, that's something that I'm dealing with personally inside of the organization. So I appreciate you giving me that insight. I, I do have one more question that's come up. It says, um, um, this goes back to EQ really fast. I agree 110% about the importance of EQ. How can these immeasurables be identified or cited, identified, cited, and portrayed in a non-woo-woo -woo way? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, emotions in this stuff is not woo-woo. It's, it's one of the, and no offense to the person that asked that question. I get asked this question a lot. Uh, I've got a CEO I'm coaching right now. Like, I don't like that touchy-feely stuff. Uh, this is what keeps your people working. If they're highly competent, but they're emotionally crippled, they're not going to do great work. This isn't, it isn't a nice to have, it's a have to have. So, you know, one of the ways you can measure this is engagement. Um, and you can also measure it in taking the temperature of your team and seeing if they're still smiling, if they're still focused on work. And it's, again, when I do this with workshops, it's five to seven to one. Is my leader connected to me? Did they genuinely care about me versus is my leader highly competent in this area? So what we need to do is people who are very data driven back up and say, this is a strategy. Taking care of my people, being emotionally connected and show them that I care. Doesn't mean you got to cry or, or be woo woo. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about with inspiring leaders is you don't have to jump up and down and do backflips and, you know, rah, rah, sis, boom, bah. 
your people will see that if you're inspired, you are passionate about what you do, you might be quiet and humble and introverted, but they will be inspired by you because you're inspired by what you do. You'll be inspiring. I think right now is the time to break down some of your armor and step over that line and show as much genuine compassion and understanding and care as you possibly can. And the data points are gonna be engagement, great work, customer focus, all the stuff we need right now. Um, Andy, did you feel like I hit it on that do you, or you wanna add more? No, I think that's really good in the way you did it. I got one more question and then I'm gonna let you get to the B. Um, and this is about wage reductions and layoffs and furloughs. So assuming we have built up a strong emotional reservoir with our employees, are we being authentic if we tell them we have their backs, but still plan to do wage reductions? It's a tough question. Yeah, it's a very tough question. And the answer is full transparency is to say, I've got your back for as long as I can that I'm going to hold on to you guys and I'm going to do everything I can to support you. But if our business continues to go down at the rate it's going down, you know that we're going to have to make some dramatic cuts and there might be, some of you leaving, uh, but I wanna make it as few as possible and I'm happy to meet with each one of you and talk about what we can do and how we can be flexible, but I care about you. I want to, and I, I need to make this, this organization stay alive for all of us. So maybe when this happens, if you have, if you have to be let go, I wanna bring you back if I possibly can. Uh, and, and that's the thing of, I care about you, I love you, I want this to go okay, but we have to, Actually, you gave a great quote this morning on your video um, from Viktor Frankl from his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And um, he said, uh, he was in Auschwitz, as you said, a prisoner of war there. And here was the quote from Dr. Frankl. Everything can be taken, but the only one thing, uh, but only one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Um, I think one of the other things, there's a thing called the Stockdale Paradox. And this was named after uh, James Stockdale, who was the highest ranking military officer, uh, Navy officer, to be captured and sent to the Hanoi Hilton for eight years, uh, tortured constantly. And when he got out, he basically phrased uh, Jim Stockdale, James Stockdale. Um, this, and I think this is what we have to, to portray to our employees and to ourselves. And here's the quote, please listen carefully. You must confront the most brutal facts of your current reality without ever losing faith that you will prevail in the end. I'm gonna say that one more time because it's really critical. You must confront, confront the most brutal facts of your current reality without ever losing faith that you will prevail in the end. So to answer that question is you have to help your folks confront the brutal reality that if business continues to go down, no matter how hard you try, because there are gonna be companies that are going to, to go out of business or, get, or have to lay a lot of people off, is just tell them I'm gonna hang on as long as I can. I'm gonna do everything I can, and I'm gonna share information so all of you see what's happening financially. It's not, just, it's not me jumping up and down, but this is the brutal facts of reality, and we're gonna, we're gonna support each other as much as we can. Andy, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, the, only, the only additional piece, uh, thought process would be, um, and I will give you enough time so that you're aware of it, right? So it wouldn't be, you know, you walk in on Friday and, you know, make these choices. But the, the sooner you can let people know as you're inching closer towards that decision and inform them in a way that they have time to prepare for it if that is the ultimate outcome. So that time, zone, time lag might be important. Really, really, really good advice. Yeah. Nobody wants to lay anybody off. It's yeah. painful. I mean, it's really painful. But if it's the difference between losing one or two people and losing the entire company and everybody's job, that's a difficult decision that leaders need to make. Now, it's interesting that the next one on this thing is belongingness. That, again, now in this time of crisis, uh, at all times, people want to be part of the tribe. They want to belong. They want to feel like people care about them and that we're a community. And uh, now that people are isolated more than ever, we need to reach out to them through Zoom, through phone calls, through email, not just about what needs to get done, but I, I care about you. We're trying to get through this together. Uh, we're a team. While doing that, face the brutal facts of reality, but we're gonna get through this as, as best we possibly can. And 
folks, uh, we're in a time that we've never seen before. Uh, I went through 9-11 with my, one of the companies I was running. Um, I went through Hurricane Andrew and lost everything I owned in the world. I lived in my car for four months, which by the way, as I look back on it, and I, I hope we look back on this too, I thought was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Because I, I got, I mean, and there was no knowing, we knew it was coming, but one day you had a house and all this stuff, and the next day it was gone, everything gone. And I found out through that thing, which I, I'm thankful for now, I realized it was just stuff. It was just, it, it was books and TVs and uh, whatever it was, it was all gone, I couldn't get it back, and now I have almost no attachment to stuff. I like stuff. But if my house burned down to the ground, as long as my dogs and my wife are okay, I'd go, it's just a house, you know? We've got insurance, we'll rebuild. So hopefully in the future, we'll look back on this and say, man, it was hard. Wow, that was brutal. But I learned some amazing lessons that are gonna inform and change the rest of my life. And the last one here, cause I wanna, I've got, still got some fair amount of stuff to cover and I wanna get through it, uh, is appreciation. And even me, after doing this for years and years and years, I didn't realize how important it is to praise people with genuine gratitude and specific, meaningful praise. And I think now we need to go out of our ways to catch people doing things right. Uh, and even smaller things than we used to, to praise. So the, the research that I've seen shows that someone needs some sort of honest, specific praise once every seven to 10 days. So I encourage you with your teams to create a culture of praising each other, supporting each other, helping each other. And although it was critical before, it's even more important now because people are lonely, they're scared, safety, stability, the stuff are going over. They need to feel appreciation for how hard they're working and that they're keeping their head down and they're trying to keep the organization going. Andy, I'm about to switch to another slide. Anything to add there? Um, I would agree with that. It's something we did last week was I put these little gift packages together that were you know, like a, a crossword book and, and actually some toilet paper. And some <laughs> Hopefully and, it had a, 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 the not try on it. Yeah. It, you know, we just put this little gift pack and I wrote a nice <laughs> note to every single team member and my daughter who's home from college uh, for two days drove around, you know, the, however, you know, whatever the geographic, you know, all of middle Tennessee, just delivering these to the doors of our team members so that, that we could show them, you know, we are thinking about you, even though I can't deliver this thing to you myself in person and the, just something, something small and sometimes insignificant can go a long way, especially in these times. Well, here's what I've been doing. I've been recommending the, the people that I work with and coach right now is shoot a, shoot a personal video for each one of your people. Just take your phone, pick it up and go, Hey Scott, I hope you and the twins are doing okay. I understand that Ryan's a little ill right now. I hope everything's good there. And I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about you and Leah. And I really appreciate how hard you're working right now. And if you need anything, you just send me an email or give me a call. I'm, I'm here to support you in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for helping us get through this together. Uh, I, you know, unless, I, hell, I don't care if you got 200 employees. Uh, or, you know, just maybe do a big group one. But if you're a smaller, mid -to -size, you know, mid-sized company, 100 employees, there's no reason on the face of the earth you can't say, take some time and shoot a one-minute video for every single one of the people you work with and, the, and your clients and the people you care about, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, I want to, you know what, everybody? You're going to hate this. I'm going to slip. I'm going to skip this slide, uh, but I'll, I'll explain it quickly. What we're looking here from, this is basically IQ and EQ, if, if you, and you've got a, a quote-unquote leader with high IQ, low EQ. The word I use there is respect. I respect that they're talented and they're competent and they're smart, but because it doesn't seem like they care about me, I don't trust them. They see, it seems like they only care about themselves and how smart and bright and talented they are. And a lot of times under pressure, people will fall into this. They'll fall into do as I say, make this happen, you know, order, order, order. Um, that's not built. It, it's I respect you trying to do things and get the company going forward, but I don't trust that you care about me personally. Um, the next one is low competence, low concern. Uh, I'm incompetent and I don't care about you. Um, that's going to be exposed pretty quickly. And the word we use there is distrust. Up at the high end is someone with very high EQ but low IQ. Uh, as our one question uh, person asked, this would be, you know, the king of woo-woo. <laughs> uh, 
And this is someone that really, really cares, but they don't have a path for how to get out of here. They don't have a vision and a plan and a strategy. They're not taking the time to sit down. So I'm sending everybody notes. I care about my team. I love you, but everyone's going back on, I don't think he or she has a good idea how we're going to get through this. I don't think they have a plan. So what we want to do as leaders is trust. Um, we want to show high concern. I care about all of you and high competency. I have a vision for how to get out of this together. And one of the books I wrote, uh, I'm going to, no one needs to buy it because I'm going to summarize the entire book in one sentence. It's my philosophy. One of my philosophies of leadership. I'm good at what I do and I do it because I care about you right now. Everybody you lead needs to see this from you. I'm competent. I'm working hard. I'm building a plan. I have a vision. I'm, I'm taking in information. I'm doing everything I can to lead this organization well, and I'm doing it all to support you, to help you, to help your families, to help our company be, survive and, and thrive. So I'm good at what I do, and I do it because I care about you. Um, Andy, anything to add right there? Um, no, I just wrote that down because that's awesome. Keep going. Thank you. So the last one we had IQ, EQ, the last one is a brand new one that most people haven't seen, which is AQ, which is your adaptability or your agility quotient. It's your ability to, and, and now I, I have, when I've given this, I give this as a TED talk about three months ago, then I was saying that this is going to be the most important one in the future. It's the most important right now. Got to have high IQ, got to be competent, got to show your people, but boy, we all have to be agile and adaptable as never before. So how do you do that? One of it is you take in lots of information. You take in new information, new ideas, you throw away old ideas that don't work, old frames of reference, point of view, and there's gonna be a bunch of them. You know, we can't do work from our house. No, we have to do work from our house. I, you know, there's a whole bunch. I could give you a list of stuff that has changed and there's nothing you can do about it. And you're gonna have to adapt and be agile and quick. So this is all about not just embracing change or reveling in change, but driving change uh, and being very quick to do it faster than you've ever done before. So agility and adaptability, your AQ, uh, essential right now. So I've just talked about a bunch of stuff that's changing uh, and it's gonna change faster and faster and faster. But I also wanna take a minute here to talk about some things that will never change, things that are fundamental. Uh, as, as, as Andy mentioned, I've spent now almost 30 years on a normal year, when, when, the plan, when we're actually on planes and helping people, I spend about 200 to 220 days a year around the world, helping all kinds of companies. Again, when I'm there, like the leadership stuff, I'm looking for the patterns. What are the patterns that consistently great organizations do over and over again that allows them to dominate the marketplace, to run, a highly, run and build a highly successful company? And I looked at this and finding it a couple ways. Um, I'm not plugging my book. I am plugging Andy's book. Go buy Andy's book, Vitamin B. But the reason I put up this up here is when I wrote my book, it was about 70,000 words long, 70,000 words. And after I finished it, I found this really cool software program called Wordle. And what Wordle allows you to do is to put the text of a document in and it finds the pattern, which you keep hearing me say because one of the elements of excellence of being really good at what you do is your ability to see patterns that other people don't see. So I loaded it all in there. It spit out a picture. I'm like, awesome, my entire book on one sheet because I'm very visual. And then I realized I, I've only got one point of view and I'm not that smart. So I reached out to a whole bunch of people and asked them if I could have the, the, uh, the copy, the words from their books, uh, the drafts. So a lot of people sent me that. Um, even a friend of mine, Todd Statterson, that wrote a book called The 100 Best Business Books of All Time. And I CEOs, Harvard articles, on and on. I won't drag you through it. I put not 70,000 words. I put well over 100,000 pages into Wordle to look for the pattern of great companies. And here it is. Uh, and my tagline is making the very complex awesomely simple. This is not awesomely simple. So I boiled it down to this. This is what I call my formula for business excellence. These are four things that no matter what's going on, Pandemic, whatever, business as usual, I believe every organization needs to focus on. So let's go through it quickly. The T stands for talent. And I'm gonna put this in the, in the juxtaposition of what we're going through right now. You gotta have the best people you can possibly get on your team. Now is the time to take insanely good care of your employees. 
to, to support them, help them, give them the training, the resources, the empowerment, everything you can to let them do the best work they've ever done. Um, because now is the time that you have to put out the best work you've ever done. Um, I, I, like I said, I coached a lot of companies through the Great Recession, and there were two or three things I, I told them about, and they're, they're in, this, in this formula. So number one is take care of your talent. Get the best people you can, keep the best people you can, keep them with everything they need to be superior at their job. The C stands for culture. And right now, it's leaning back on, as Andy started this off, the values that you've built in your organization, the culture of camaraderie, of caring. And right now, I think it's time to push harder than ever on a culture of innovation, on a culture of agility and adaptability. So you have to take all those things you've already had in your values and infuse them with a sense of urgency to iterate, innovate, uh, change, move, move, move. The ECF stands for extreme customer focus. Extreme. So again, the number one of the key things to focus on right now is to get as close to your customer as you possibly can, not physically, <laughs> but uh, through every means, through Zoom, through call, through email, through text, to keep in touch with them. I have a, a phrase I use constantly, whoever owns the voice of the marketplace, or whoever owns the voice of the customer owns the marketplace. So let's back up. You've got to have great talent because they're the ones that are going to deliver world-class works, work and services to your customers right now. Do that first. Get as close to your customers as you possibly can. And then the last thing is you're going to have to have the discipline to execute on this efficiently. So quickly, I'll back up. The formula is talent plus culture plus extreme customer focus multiplied by disciplined execution equals business excellence. And on the execution piece, I wrote a few things down here that I wanted to share with you, um, is basically focus and routine. That you've gotta help your people understand this is the stuff that's gotta get done. We need to focus on these core things and help them keep a routine so they don't get distracted. They're not all the time watching the news or checking social media for how the bad things are happening. But the discipline to do their work, to do great work, and to try as much as possible to let it I just did a video on this. So here's a workshop for all of you. I want you to write a list very carefully of the things you can control right now. What is everything you can impact, influence, and, and take control of now? And be brutally honest with yourself. Write that list out, look at it, and then take massive control of those things. Just focus, focus, focus on controlling those. Then I want you to write another list, and I'm, I'm totally serious here, of everything you cannot control right now. And that list is long. Coronavirus, the, the economy, the government, uh, quarantine, write it all down, look at it, and then try as hard as you can not to think about those at all. Let go of them. You can't fix that stuff, which is hard for us as leaders that we're used to fixing things. You can't fix that stuff. So focus on the things you can fix. Put your time, energy, and effort there. And as much as you can, let go of everything on the list of you stuff you can't control. Uh, last but not least, I am going to skip that one because that's about a five minute slide. Um, right now, I believe that all of us need to balance two things as leaders. And it, you've seen it come up in the questions. One is courage and confidence. We've got to show our people that we have strength, that we can handle these tough decisions, that we're going to be courageous in, in making our company as stable and strong as we possibly can. Uh, and projecting confidence that, as Ad, uh, Admiral Stockdale said, we will persevere in the end. We're going to be courageous at looking at the brutal facts, and we're going to have confidence we can, per, we can prevail, and then balancing that out with transparency, authenticity, and vulnerability. So I, I've got this, but I also need your help. I care about you. I care about how you're feeling, and I want to, as much as I possibly can, support you and help you and tell you the truth as uncomfortable and challenging as painful as it, might, it could be but we're going to do everything we can to get through this together so andy that is the main stuff that i wanted to cover today um, we've got as much time as you want to do for q a or people want to stay on and i quickly put this up and then i'll bounce it in about one minute to just a, a plain slide with our logos so floor is open for questions comments concerns issues you adding new stuff 
Yeah, so we've got a few things. Let's see. Um, everybody's talking. We got uh, Poland on here. We got Canada on here. Um, you guys bounce your questions either in the Q&A or the chat box, and I can get those delivered to John. So if we, we kind of run back through this, we started around IQ, right? So um, I believe right now is a time that we can learn like we've nev maybe never in our lifetimes learned before. Uh, and not only some of us, some people are, are got a lot of time on their hands right now. And some people don't have any time on their hands right now. And we can both learn at equal paces. I feel like right now I'm learning like I've never learned before. So I think that's really good. And then getting into the EQ side of this and making sure that we're wrapping our arms around our teams being highly, highly important. Um, we had Greg Crabtree on a couple of days ago on a webinar and one of the things he said was, you know, we just spent the last decade scratching and clawing to put teams together, uh, you know, to find the very best people we possibly could get. And now is the time for us to keep them. So I thought those two kind of balance pieces were very good. Can you give me uh, the DE? That's the disciplined execution. Somebody asked, what does that stand for? Can you give me a little riff on what does disciplined execution mean to you, John? Okay, so actually, this is a this is a great segue, and, and I have a, a six step formula for creating discipline. Another word for that would be accountability, and I think right now this is going to help everybody because it can be done at a distance. So here's the six steps: If I'm going to hold somebody accountable to execute something with discipline, something that's mission critical, something that's got to get done, because right now I'm going to let people slip a little bit on other things, but if I got to get this done, it's mission critical. Here's the six steps: Number one is 100% clarity with appropriate authority and resources. So I wanna get, talk to that person on Zoom or through email, make it exceptionally clear exactly what success looks like. No guessing. Um, one of my favorite business quotes in the history is, of, of all businesses, ambiguity breeds mediocrity. Ambiguity breeds mediocrity. So you have to sit down with that person and say, this is what we're gonna do, here's the KPIs, this is when it's due. This is what success looks like. This is what I need from you. You have all the decision-making authority you need. You have access to budget, whatever it might be. Um, and um, if you need any more resources, people, equipment, whatever it might be, you let me know and I'll take it. So 100% clarity, appropriate authority and resources. Number two is 100% agreement. That person has to look back at you in Zoom or, and I would say send an email fully outlining what they understood. You know, what do I owe you? Because what I want is I want them to tell me what I want them to do. So I want to know they're 100% on board. So I need it written out. I need the dates. I need the, everything as much detail. Then at the bottom of that, I want two things written there. One is I believe this is a reasonable goal. And number two is I accept 100% accountability. It's what we call an accountability agreement. Uh, number three then is track and post which we can do uh, easily virtually with desk, with uh, desk, uh, what do they call those things? You look at them, um, dashboards, things like that, Excel spreadsheets through Slack, whatever it might be, but tracking progress. Uh, so we track it and then everybody's watching it and I'm, I'm looking at people's progress as their leader to make sure that they're staying focused and on track. Uh, number four is the big one. Most people feel like when you're tracking them, you're gonna track them to yell at them for them to get in trouble. So you're not doing what you need to do. Uh, number four is coach, mentor, train, support. So when someone, and I, I use green, yellow, red. You know, green, you're doing great. Yellow, you're in a little trouble. Red, you're failing. When someone slips from green to yellow, you don't yell at them or get mad at them or punish them. You help them. You send a note. How can I help you? What can I do? What support do you need? Let me give you a little coaching through this. Let me mentor you on some stuff I'm learning and things like that. But instead of, getting mad that someone is starting to struggle, you get everybody to get in and help them get back into green. Uh, which leads to the last two things, which is celebrate success. And now even the smallest successes, you know, put up, do a little picture of a half, you know, of whatever, get a video of, you know, confetti and people go, Ooh, or whatever it might be. But then also deal decisively with mediocrity. If you've got someone who's consistently not meeting their goals, consistently not delivering, uh, and they're red, 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 and you're coaching, mentoring, training, supporting everybody is, and they're not getting back in red, unfortunately, you've just figured out who some of the people that will likely be the first people to leave your company. Um, because you're helping them and helping and helping, and they're not doing what they need to do to help the company. So discipline execution, another word I would use there is accountability. There's the six steps that I teach around how to create a culture of accountability. 
So two things that I'll add to that is, um, and I think Lee is on the other side listening. Um, I'm going to send in the recap to everybody that registered. We'll, we'll do a full recap. We have two team members right now that are taking notes feverishly to capture everything that we're talking about. So they'll you know, get that into a nice little format. We've captured the video and recorded it. So it'll be on the website, petrocoach.com. So you can uh, replay the video and we'll have the slides so we can you know, show those as well. I'm going to add to that. We have a tool, a, a set of tools that we use for exactly what you said. Um, literally, it's this is the priority. Here's step one, step two. Who owns it? How long is it going to take that person to actually do it? And what is the due date of that particular task? And those tools are very, very simple and easy to use. You assign a KPI to it, all that stuff that you just said. So I'm going to include those tools. Um, and there's also one for these are the big, chunky priorities. And then here's the individual priorities that have alignment to them. So I'll include those tools in there. And then, you know, John, we have that software that we created a bunch of years ago, uh, aligntoday.com. That is that dashboard that you just talked about, the green, yellow, red progression on how people are doing. Um, I mean, that might be something that people want to check out. Actually, I use it in several of my clients. Yeah. So uh, that's a good thing for people to look at at this time. Um, they're, they're doing great work over there. I don't run that company anymore. Somebody else is doing it, but um, check that out as well. So dashboards and I'll, I'll include those planning tools. Let me add one thing to this, Andy, and it's probably in your system, but one of the reasons I'm such a fan of getting them to write it all out and give it back to me and say, I believe this is reasonable and I take accountability. So if they start to slip, they can't go, I didn't think this was fair. The goals were too hard. Like, no, you wrote them. I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. No, you wrote it. You haven't given me everything I need. You, no, we made a list of all the resources. You have everything. So at least that way, when you hold them accountable, the rest of the team sees it was very fair, it was reasonable, it wasn't ambiguous, the person knew what they needed to do, there was no guessing, and they didn't meet the goals that they agreed to and set and, and wrote themselves based on the goals that you wanted to accomplish. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you, you do that in collaboration, right? So John, right. you would write the plan. I call it the, the 80, 85 15. So you're going to get it 85% correct anyway. So, you know, all that stuff's going to be in there. And all I'm going to do is help collaborate on the last 15%. We'll put it all together. And what I tell my team is when you commit to go do this, I expect it to be completed in the time frame. There is a like unfettered access to me or any resources you may need in the meantime, but by the due date, you can't show up and it's not done. Yeah. Right? So it's, you know, you can ask for anything. You know, I, there's never an excuse of um, I didn't have the time to do it because you agreed to it now, but in the middle of it, if we need to make a change, especially right now with what we're going through, we'll have to make lots of change and be flexible. As you said, agile. Um, I totally agree with what you just said. I've got a couple more questions. Um, this is actually a pretty good one. Uh, how do you balance all the work with trying to keep the company together, personal learning, personal life and family life? Okay. So a couple of things there. Partially, that's that list of things you can control and can't control and letting go of that, uh, all the stuff on that other list. And, and part of that, and here's the big one, is figuring out what to say no to. Um, I've been teaching strategy for years, and one of the things I learned is one of the main things that a great strategic thinker does is figure out what not to do. Where are we not going to invest time, energy, effort, resources? It's the same for you. So it's, it's being brutal at looking at how you are spending your time and deciding that I need to replace this thing over here, and Andy and I were talking Netflix or too much time on Facebook or whatever it might be, uh, with things that are really going to help me—a walk around the yard, this, that, and the other, whatever it might be. <clears throat> but the way to balance this is to not try to do it all, and realize there's some stuff in there that you're just going to simply, right now, have to say no to. Uh, and when I work with CEOs, they'll say, "You don't understand, John. I don't have any time at all." When we write this list out and then they track how they actually spend their time compared to the list, it's usually not aligned at all. And especially now you have to have the discipline to say, this is the stuff I've got to do. This is the stuff that can wait, or this is the stuff that isn't going to add a lot of value to, to my company, to my team, to my family, to my health. This isn't a priority right now. And that's a hard decision to make. Andy, I'm, I'm sure that you've got some comments on this. Uh, this is, I spend my life in this particular place, right? So I think it is defining what is important, um, getting it down in writing. Yes, yes. 
right? Uh, in very specific language, which I think people, uh, my experience is people have a really difficult time being very specific, meaning what would success look like when it's complete? Not necessarily what is the process. Always putting a due date on it and then keeping what's important in front of you. And at the same time, minimizing those distractions. We, we've been beating off on Netflix, um, you know, for the last 40 minutes. And I've, I did it a little bit this morning, but there's tons of more distractions. Oh, yeah now so the more you can minimize those and then you know create some kind of a tracking system this is my personal tracking system this is just my personal side of my world yeah so i create you know, all of this on a on a well actually goes out to age 65 i bring it down to a year then i look at a quarter then i look at a month and i look at a week then i look at a day and i track all of it so this goes back this is my dashboard for my personal life and then we use the other tool um, aligned for the, the business side. So I've got mine sitting over there. I won't roll over to it. But what I also do is I, for the day, I put a little sticky thing with all the, the key things I've got to get done. And I stick it on my, on my screen every day so I can't escape it. it this, until this stuff's done, nothing on the face of the earth matters uh, other than family and health. And yep. I'm not going to, you know, me, I like to check Facebook to see how my friends around the world are doing. Like you, I have friends all over the world. I want to know how things are going. But I look at it and say, I am not, I will give myself 10 minutes to do that after these three things are completed. And no matter what comes up, I'm not going to look at any social media until these things are done. And that also means that I can reward myself with 10 minutes. And I time it, put it I put, use my Alexa and set a 10-minute time limit. And then after that, I go take it in the middle of the day, a 10 minute walk around uh, the block where my office is, or when I'm working out of the house, I work alone in an office that, and I've got no one here so I can social distance. But at home, I take three laps around the yard with my dogs and take my 10 minute walk. And that routine has helped me come back and stay focused. Yeah, and I think that's a little bit of the discipline side of this. The thing that I've found is um, time blocking. So that's what you're like, just- yeah. Put it in your calendar, block the time for it. If I can see your calendar, I know what you're actually focused on. And the other thing is, I believe one of the only times that we can tr can actually control is first thing in the morning. So the ability, like I know it, when I, if I could get up, like this morning I got up at 5.15, I went out, I have a farm behind the house, I went out, I went for a, a run this morning. If I'd have said, hey, you know, I'm gonna put that run at three o'clock this afternoon, there's all kinds of craziness happens between the morning and the afternoon. And I'm going to bump that many times, but if I can, I can control that morning time. So put the things that are important to you early in the day. Um, we, what, uh, oh, there was a question around, um, SBA, just run through SBA and what that stands for really quick. Yeah, that's safety and that's physical, emotional, and intellectual. Physically I'm safe. My health is safe. Emotionally, no one's going to yell or scream at me or they're going to respect my emotions. And then psychological says people are going to, I'm safe to put my ideas on the table. You know, uh, I've worked at Microsoft and one of their things are uh, people are safe, ideas are not. Uh, you know, we, we're going to tear it up. I'm safe that we're going, to, we're going to do this, but no one's going to attack me personally or make fun of me for putting a quote unquote crazy idea out. So safety, physical, uh, physical emotional, psychological safety belongingness. I want to feel like I'm part of the tribe, that people care of me. It's a family as much as we can, and we, we're going to care for each other. And then the last one is appreciation. Um, people really care about the work I do. They appreciate it. Um, I add value. Let me add one more thing to this, Andy. There's a, some new research that came out, you know, that, that has three new letters, SDP. Uh, and the S is very similar. In this study, it's stability, which I said is very much like safety critical. Give me some stability in my life. We have to be as leaders, giving as much as we can to our people. D is a really interesting one. It's dignity. Yeah. And you can't, the funny thing is you can't give dignity. What you give is trust, empowerment, and praise. And when someone feels like you're trusted, you've empowered me, and I'm doing a good job, I have a sense of self-efficacy, I feel dignity. I feel like I'm treated with dignity. And then when people feel that, they treat other people that way. So um, it's empowerment again, it's trust, it's praise, it's, it's telling someone you are valuable and we care about you. And then the last one, which is interesting and it's a, a nice thing to add to this, is purpose. I want to know that even though I'm sitting at home working on my computer, that I'm doing something important. I'm helping keep our company alive, we're serving our customers, I make a difference in the world, 
Um, I'm also social distancing to help the world, to help my neighbors. So there's a purpose to me sitting here in my house as, as uncomfortable and isolated and lonely as it might feel, I'm still serving a, a purpose for our community. And by doing my work, I'm serving a purpose for our organization, for our community and our other employees and our customers. So it's safety, belongingness, appreciation, stability, dignity, and purpose. That's awesome. Well, we're right up on time. Uh, looks like all the questions are in. There's a comment here I thought was pretty interesting. It said, hard on the problem, soft on the people. I thought that yep. was cool. Uh, Love that. John, you've helped us uh, fulfill a purpose here, which is have a positive impact on 10 million human beings. And we've certainly you know, expanded that today with your help. I greatly appreciate you being here. Um, everybody that's listening, I'll give, I'll give John the last word in just a second. We're going to do a recap of this with notes and videos so you have access to it. It'll all be up on petracoach.com as well, along with all the other resources as we're going through this time. We're posting everything up there. And then uh, John, both John and Petra, all of our coaches, we're here to help. You know, we do this work as part of the you know, business that we're in. So when we send you a recap, we'll give you some information about how to you know, reach out to us if you need any additional insight on anything. John, I'll turn the, the last word over to you. Well, two things. Number one, if you found what, what was helpful in this, please share it with everybody you can. Um, as, as Annie said, we're here to help, and I, I hope that some of these ideas will help you. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is at the end of the day, it's all about love. Love your family, uh, love your employees, love your customers, and love yourself. Uh, we're going through trying times, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, and as leaders, we've got we've to hunker down and do what we can. And I think that's focused on love. And if we just love each other a lot, we'll all get through this together. So again, Andy, your whole team there, it's been an honor to do this with you. I really appreciate it. And keep on your track of helping 10 million human beings. Awesome, brother. I'll see you around. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother.